Episode of Progress, Potential, and Possibilities, discussions with fascinating people designing a better tomorrow for all of us. I'm your host, Ira Pastor. Welcome, uh, everybody, again to another episode of the show. Today, bringing you another really fascinating guest uh, involved in creating a better tomorrow. Uh, today, we have the honor of being joined uh, by Dr. Parag Malik, uh, who is an associate professor at Stanford University and co founder of Nautilus Biotechnology, a really interesting development development stage life sciences company. Uh, they're engaged in creating a really unique platform technology for quantifying and unlocking the complexity of the proteome uh, for an entirely new era of scientific discoveries. Uh, Dr. Mack was originally trained as an engineer and biochemist. Uh, his research spans uh, domains from proteomics to computational and experimental systems biology to cancer biology, as well as nanotechnology. Uh, he received his undergraduate degree in computer science from Washington University in St. Louis, went on to do his PhD from UCLA in chemistry and biochemistry, uh, and then completed postdoc studies at uh, the Institute of Systems Biology. Uh, and his group has been involved in, in pioneering systems biology approaches towards understanding disease mechanisms, uncovering uh, unique biomarkers, as well as enabling uh, this exciting future of personalized medicine, uh, has hundreds of publications to his name, as well as numerous patents in areas like artificial intelligence, proteomics technology, biomarker development, and nanotech. Uh, and then when he's not doing all that, uh, he is also a, an accomplished magician uh, performing for clients all over the world, including Fortune 500 companies. We'll be getting into that topic as well. A uh, lot to get into today. Uh, a lot of interesting themes. i um, excited to do this show. Dr. Parag Malik, thank you so much for taking time to come on the show today. I'm delighted. Thank you so much for having me. It's um, a really exciting set of technologies that you've been working on. Uh, would love to, as we typically do, you know, sort of start off uh, sort of in the early days. You know, it's kind of funny because uh, I a couple months ago, I, I hosted Craig Venter on the show and I just finished up wrapping up an episode with Francis Collins, sort of talking about the early days of the Human Genome Project in the early 2000s. Uh, you at that time, you know, were thinking pretty far ahead. You're like, you know, a lot of, a lot of stuff going on with the genome, but we really have to focus so on getting this this proteome stuff going uh your 2002 dissertation you know heavily involved in sort of understanding you know what was going on in terms of protein folding at the time you were developing some really interesting tools on on, on atomic salvation uh, concepts and in, in proteins what got you interested in the proteome to begin with we'd love to hear sort of the early days of how you got started on all this well you know the early days actually go back even further than that uh, my my first exploration, my first interest in the proteome came when I was in high school. Nice. Uh, I was I was I went to space camp. My life plan was to be an astronaut. And one of our counselors at space camp was talking about this challenge of when you put people in space for long periods of time, they have all they have muscle atrophy, bone atrophy. And this counselor said, you know, really the challenge is this dysregulation of the calcium cycle. And what we really need are we need some new designer hormones and new designer proteins that can selectively alter the calcium cycle and allow astronauts to uh, survive longer, have less uh, have less consequences, but they need to be really specific so they don't just hit absolutely everywhere. And but what I didn't realize at the time was these designer protein molecules were that he was hypothesizing that we needed protein design methods to find 
uh, you know, that's kind of what your dream dream therapeutic is. You want something that's really specific, targets one particular process and doesn't hit everything else. And, uh, and at that point, I was like, wow, proteins are the thing. Like we need to solve this protein folding problem so we can do protein design and understand how proteins drive biology. And, uh, and so that was, that was that very first moment was saying, wow, I need to, I need to understand how these protein things work. And, and, you know, it's it's interesting. You wrote a uh, a really interesting uh, paper. This was back in 2018 in, in Nature Chemical Biology, entitled "How Many Human Proteoforms Are There?" And you know, we we've introduced you know, the the proteome on, on past shows. You know, talked about you know the sort of the genome, transcriptome, proteome axis. But when we get to proteins, you know, th things are not you know don't always match up one to one. Uh, and you know, you point out you know in this paper, obviously there's uh, different ways that post-transcriptional modifications occur. There's alternate splicing. Uh, there's all interesting ways that proteins on their own sort of repurpose their structure. So, you know, there's quite a large, I guess what, you know, I think I've also seen the, the term proteosphere out there. Talk a little bit about what we're going to be talking about today in terms of the proteome, the human proteome, and what it really encompasses is because it's quite a bit larger than, you know, not to belittle the genome folks, but there's <laughs> quite a bit of proteomic space out there uh, for discovery. Yeah, yeah, I think, I think people in the world, they think the genome is everything and your genome governs how your body functions it's 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 absolutely the key and it's, it's because it's out in society there are movies like jurassic park and gattaca and others that have really socialized the concept of the genome and the reality is that your genome is is a blueprint it tells you what might possibly happen uh, you know the way that i think about it is like with your house you know, the, the blueprint for your house, it's locked away in the assessor's office, and it kind of says what somebody intended with your house, but it doesn't know that one day your kids went crazy and they painted on the walls. It doesn't know that one day you were feeling ambitious and you took a sledgehammer to create a new doorway. None of those things are captured in the blueprint. And on, on the other hand, that's that's really what the proteins are. They change every second of every day and every cell throughout your body. They're what does work in your body. They're, they're the things that that both influence how your cells and how your physiology function. And they also report out on all of those things. So uh, the way that I think about it is uh, the genome is the, the fundamental predictor of what might be, but the proteome captures what is. Excellent. And, and uh, in capturing uh, what is uh, clearly in that proteosphere? Uh, there are you know tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands potentially of proteins that we may uh, have somewhere cataloged, but then you know an entire range of unknown proteins. Um, and, and your work, you know, again going back to sort of the days of your dissertation and, and creating these uh, you know, atomic-based descriptions of uh, what a protein could be. In 20, 2002, on to where we are today, obviously the technologies and the tools that you've used to do this work have evolved a lot, and we'll be getting into Nautilus in a bit, but talk a little bit about the evolution of these tools and, and a little bit of what how things have changed since your dissertation to the current day. I know, I know you've talked about, I've watched several shows where you've talked about this. Uh, you don't have to go, you know, into a major uh, lecture on it, but it would love to hear sort of the background, the sort of uh, lay of the landscape a, as we sit here in 2024. Absolutely. I think, I think just for my own personal journey, when I started, started back then, my view of what proteins did, their function was really focused on enzymatic function. It was really focused on the protein itself as a canonical unit. And if I understood everything about its structure, that would help me understand everything. And, and I think at that time we were structural genomics efforts were just kicking off. And so people were solving structures at an unprecedented pace. Uh, and then as we started to learn more and gather more protein structures, understand a little bit better, alongside systems biology methods coming in, those core aspects of how proteins work together, how they interact with each other, how they move from place to place, how they get modified and uh, get decorated with different phosphorylation events. All of that dynamism and context really has expanded our view of what protein function even means. It's no longer, you know, there sort of was the one gene, uh, one phenotype 
Beatle and Tatum going way back in time. And I think where we've where we're evolving now is a similar transformation of understanding about proteins. It's not one protein, one function. It's one protein, many contexts, many functions, many behaviors, often even within the same cell at the same time, you'll have different proteins in different places doing different things. And so what fully hasn't caught up though with amazing advances is even just measuring which proteins are present, where are they present, how much of each is present, that sort of first layer of what's in the system. I, I think the back then our tools were maybe able to measure a couple hundred proteins and it was pretty cumbersome. The The tools in the field have advanced. Now we can measure thousands of proteins, but it's still a, it's still a, a, a technologically, analytically hard challenge to, to do. And so the field has ad advanced by orders of magnitude. We've learned a lot. But in learning a lot, we've learned how much more we have to learn. Two words, if you would, about some of the sort of the early targets that, and again, we'll be talking a little about pre-Nautilus days. We'll get to Nautilus yeah. in a moment. But some of the things that you went after, I mean, I noticed some papers in in your uh, in, in the in the dossier, uh, you were looking at, uh, you were working with David Agus on, on sort of protein profiling of blood, which has become an, an extremely hot topic in, in recent years. But you were looking at this back in, in, in 2005, thinking about how we would do that in such a sort of a complex mixture of, of possibilities. Uh, I think you did some work on, on on mycobacterium tuberculosis, looking at the, again, that's a, that's been a hot one for us in the sense that, you know, our, our vaccine is, is a hundred plus years old and we, we need new targets, you know, uh, against some of these infectious disorders. Um, talk a little bit about what things were like, I guess, when uh, it wasn't as easy, let's say, to go after thousands of proteins in a sample uh, and some of the targets you were focusing on back in the day. Yeah. So if we, if we go back to my, my earliest work, it was at the genomes, the bacterial genomes, archaeal genomes were just coming about. They were brand new in the world. They had just been sequenced. There was one that was sequenced by hand manually uh, upstairs in my building. It was called Pyrobaculum aeropholum. It was this crazy bacteria that uh, lived in deep sea vents uh, at you know, 106 degrees Celsius. And, uh, and so the first question was, and protein structure prediction back then was, was really pretty boutique -y. It was done one protein at a time. And the major contribution that, that we made was let's scale that up. Let's see if we can predict protein structures for every single protein in these new organisms to try to understand what things are special to those organisms, what drives their behavior, what makes it so that tuberculosis is particularly aggressive, what makes it so that pyrobaculum aeropholum can survive at 106 degrees Celsius above the boiling point. And, uh, and there was a lot of computational machinery that needed to be developed to even ask those questions, just the scale of the questions, what was the right uh, understanding of biology so we could predict things on a genome scale, proteome scale, protein structures. Uh, and then from that, can we then infer what is driving some of the aggressivity of tuberculosis? What is driving, um, what is distinguishing of a particularly mean form of tuberculosis? Is it having more of this protein or this particular protein with this structure? Those were the kinds of questions we were asking is, is really on a proteome scale, if we had protein structures for everything, which we do now today, but but back then that was that was the first ever ever efforts in, at genome scale, proteome scale, protein structure prediction, and uh, and what can one do with that information? How can one understand um, physiology? And so that was that was really where I started. And then the next step from there uh, in my postdoc was thinking about cell or physiologic state. So right. when we think about my first my first step was really thinking about cell state and how cells grow right. and evolve uh, with an interest in medical questions, of course, uh, since the work on tuberculosis. But then really working with Rudy uh, Abersold, asking the question, hey, how can we tell what's going on in a person? And recognizing that blood is a great proximal fluid, easy to get, and that how can we find these proteins that are uh, upregulated in cancer? Or how can we find these proteins that tell you that this drug is going to work or that drug is going to work? Uh, what are the processes? Simple questions like how should we even collect the blood to make sure that the proteins aren't all degraded? Uh, 
those were those were huge unknowns at the time. So beyond the analytical technology, we had just fundamental pre-analytical questions that we had to ask. And uh, and that was really where it all started was how can we build the most robust process to be able to ask these questions about what's different in responders and non-responders? What's different in the mechanisms of why this cell is responding to this cancer drug and this other cell isn't? Um, those were those were the early days of of really digging into those questions. Excellent. Yeah, it's, as you talk about cell state, and, and I think about yeah, I, I, I did a couple episodes with Lee Hood uh, from ISB. And I spent some time in the past with Sui Wang uh, talking about sort of you know this this whole concept. And I think again, you know, looking at the work you do, sort of at, at the proteo state, uh, as you were mentioning, um, you know, it's not just uh, one protein that does one thing, but in different cells, how that can fluctuate and uh, pathogenic state, non pathogenic, and so forth. You really have a major. Uh, amount of space, state space to, to, to <laughs> work in there. Um, it's complicated. It's really yeah. complicated. And it, yeah. I think a, a lot of people get overwhelmed very quickly and they're like, oh, you mean I can't just look at this mutation and call it good? It's like, no. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Spot on. So, yeah. So anyway, I, I really I want to get into a bunch of the stuff that Nautilus is doing. Um, you know, clearly you have this mission of, of quantifying the entire proteome, uh, diagnostic interest, drug development, basic research. We'll go into each of those. Uh, talk about just the company in general, you know, uh, talk about, you know, why you decided, hey, I think it was 2016 or so that you said enough that, it, that it was yeah. time we need to, to set up a company around this mission to explore the protein state, <laughs> the, the protein space, uh, and properly put it to work for for all sorts of partners in, 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 in the uh, in the bio business. <laughs> Yeah, well, I think I think some important context is that for years I'd been working on a number of different axes, trying to improve the existing technologies, trying to, uh, you know, the the major workhorse in the field of proteomics is an instrument, the mass spectrometer, uh, amazing, powerful instruments, and tremendous progress over 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 the years. But despite that progress, it remain true that there are an order of magnitude more efforts and publications in genomics than there are in proteomics. And part of that is that measuring proteins is hard. Mm -hmm. uh, genomes biophysically are very homogenous. Proteins are made art, you know, you've got big proteins and little proteins and sticky proteins and charged proteins. And, and then you also don't have PCR for proteins. So if you have a small number of molecules, you have to have a measurement tool that is sensitive enough to measure a small number of molecules. So all of these things had been running around in my head for a long time about how can we just measure the proteome better? How And initially, a lot of that was focused on how can we improve mass spectrometry-based approaches. And, uh, and then, but rummaging around in my head were also, do we have to improve the mass spectrometer? Or can we maybe come up with something totally different? And you know, in the same way that the methods that are used for Sanger sequencing of, of DNA are different than our, uh, what next-gen uh, genomics use. They completely different approaches to solve this problem. So that was really where my brain started going and I was teaching a class on multiomics. My lab does do a lot of multiomics and you just see the disparities all the time of just how easy it is for anybody to RNA seq whatever they want and how challenging it can be for, for folks to get access to the proteome. Uh, so then that was, that was the foundation was just saying, you know what, we really just need better tools, complementary tools to allow people to ask simple questions, to the proteome. And I was, I was feeling that very acutely. And a number of different permutations were running around in my head about, oh, could we do this? Or could we separate things out this way? Or could we uh, really juggling lots of options? And then um, what what happened is uh, was a little unusual, really. I, I, was, I was feeling a little crunchy. And so I said, hey, you know what? I'm going to go take a road trip. I'm going to go just take a pause. And uh, at the time, I... I I got into my head. I was like, oh, I'm, you know, I'm going to do that epic New York to California, you know, coast to coast road trip. And then I, I looked at the prices of one way car rentals from New York to California and was immediately dissuaded from that. Uh, and so I then wrote a little program to calculate what the longest 
cheapest uh, one-way trek would be, and it turned out to be Detroit to Denver. Uh, so relatively cheap flight there, relatively cheap uh, car one-way car rental. And so that was the entirety of my plan was I'm going to fly to Detroit. I'm going to rent a car. I had, you know, a tent and some other things with me. Uh, and I'm going, I, the only part of this plan was I knew that a couple of weeks later I needed to be in Denver. And so every morning I would wake up and I would pick a direction and uh, say, all right, I'm going that way today. And, uh, and I think in the back of my head, as this was going along and I uh, visited some friends and I visited circus schools and I went to random magic clubs and saw national monuments. And the weekend after I got back, I, I, I literally woke up and my wife remembers this because I, I, I woke up and I was like, oh, that's how you do it. Uh, and then the next words out of my mouth were, no, that can't possibly work. And, and, and so a frenzied weekend later, there was a, a, a lot of simulation and exploration and being like, wow, there might actually be a way to measure substantively all of the proteome uh, and do it in a way that is simple and, and straightforward and maybe scalable in a way. And it was, uh, it was once you see something like that, once you, you're, you, you don't, you don't have a choice. You have to do everything you can to bring it into the world. Yeah, that's an awesome story. No, I love stories like that. Well, let's um, let's talk about some examples of of what you're going to be bringing into the world with with, with the this toolkit. Because um, again, you, you you've done an extensive amount of publishing, uh, and I thought we could start on uh, an area like uh, diagnostics. And, and you know, one theme that comes up uh, quite a bit in 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 your literature is this this principle of the the cancerome or the cancer proteome, where you know you basically look at sort of everything in the sense of not just sort of the intercellular proteins that may be out of whack in certain tumors, uh, but uh, you look at things like at proteins on the surface of cells and how that impacts deformability. Uh, you look at issues in the in the proteins of the microenvironment of, of a tumor, protein shedding. Um, clearly, Again, you know, if, and for anyone, you know, you know, unfortunately, that has had someone in their family with cancer that nowadays gets sort of a genome readout. I mean, okay, we have some mutations here. Uh, clearly, this type of work takes it in, in, in many other dimensions of, of what we can actually understand and, and make sense of some of that genomic data. Talk about the tools that you're developing in terms of the, as you say, the cancer ohm and, and what some of the potential here is, because I think it's quite extensive. Absolutely, absolutely. So I'm, I'm going to start at the at the smallest and then work my way up from there because okay. I think I think the if we just start first of all with the cancer cell, there's a fundamental question about what differentiates a cancer cancer cell from a healthy cell. We have these concepts like oh it grows faster, oh it evades the immune system, it uh, recruits vasculature, but those are really big conceptual hallmarks of cancer. But practically speaking, what's actually going on? Uh, are there are there proteins that are specifically made by cancer cells that aren't made by other cells? Are the proteins in different places? So they're usually on the cell surface, but in cancer cells, they're being secreted in some way. Uh, are So just level zero, if I just ask of the cancer cell, what what's different about you? That's the first first layer. And what could be different? Again, it could be that amounts. It could be the place. It could be the state of the proteins. They could be modified in different ways, having three phosphorylations in this set of locations instead of three phosphorylations in those locations. Uh, or it could be a combination of all of those things working together. Most likely, it's a combination of all of those things working together. So with that information. What that allows you to do is, is understand both the transition from healthy to cancer, that very earliest state of what's happening in transformation and initiation. And then it potentially allows you to find uh, what are factors that influence that transformation. So some of those pre-cancer, hey, if we did this, if we drank more orange juice, what might happen? Um, a little bit of, of wine. Uh, the... Um, and and so even in that earliest days, can we understand that very first part? 
And then the next question is, all right, well, now we've got a cancer cell and how can we, how can we either kill it or make it behave better? And that's really where the, the question of if we're trying to develop a novel therapeutic, what we want is we want a protein perhaps on the surface of that cell. So it's easy to target that is highly abundant in cancer cells and not abundant in normal cells. So that fundamental question of how do we find a new drug target for cancer? The vast majority, 95% of drugs target proteins. And if we can do a better job of finding those proteins that are differential uh, or and have the least downstream consequences, that's that's step one. And so that's really the first thing that we're hoping to enable is people being able to dive better into the biology, do a better job of understanding initial initial initiation and transformation, and then doing a better job of being able to find targets. Uh, so that's the, the smallest level. The next level up from that is, all right, I've got a great target. What's it actually doing? How is it perturbing the cell? We know even if you're only going after one protein, it's causing a network cascade down below that what's happening is that maybe that target itself is great, but three hops down from it is something that's really important to your heart. Uh, that would be great to know. <laughs> Most drugs fail because of toxicity and side effects. They don't fail because of e efficacy. They fail because of these other factors. So if we can understand the mechanism of action under the hood and the downstream consequences, the interactions, that's the next, next layer up from that. Uh, then you start to get into really fun, slightly more complicated things about intracellular interactions. So we know the hottest thing in cancer of late has been immunotherapies, where you're not even targeting the cancer cell. You're targeting the immune system uh, and activating it. And so that's that next layer is how do we activate the cells around cancer? Or uh, in the case of things like Avastin, how do we change the microenvironment of the cancer by changing the blood flow or the ability to grow new new blood vessels? Um, again, understanding the proteome, not just of the cancer cell, but the messaging between the cells. What are they secreting? How are they chatting with each other? How are they responding to being near each other or far away from each other or touching uh, you know, macrophages and, and, and dendritic cells chatting with each other to successfully activate or not? So that's that next layer of questions is, can we really understand the microenvironment, those interactions, the protein mediated interactions, active, active state, inactive state. Um, and that gives us another handle to start going after new therapies. And as, as we branch out further, the, the next question comes back to one we talked about a little before, which is as drugs get better and more specific, they also may not work on everybody. So we need to be able to understand, oh, okay, well, you have a P53 lung cancer that has this mutation. So that's what we've got so far. But okay, maybe that's not enough. Maybe you need that and you need overexpression of this protein and low expression of that protein. And can we deeply phenotype those cells to understand this drug will only work under these conditions? this combination of factors need to be true. And, uh, and so starting to get towards both the prognostic side of the world and uh, as well as tiptoeing into biomarkers of, hey, what should we look at? And I, I think that's that, that next layer of, all right, we wanna be able to sense what's happening inside the tumor, how, what is it likely to respond to? What is it actually responding to? Has it stopped responding to it? And also how, you know, the tumor is made up of a billion cells, all of which are changing all the time. How is the state and the evolution of that tumor uh, changed as a function of what we've done to it? So, um, so I, I think as we start moving into the diagnostics, the circulating biomarkers, the, the uh, markers that may be in sputum or breath exudate or, or urine, uh, really understanding what are the differentiators of of healthy versus sick in the case of diagnostics or responder, non-responder in the case of prognostics. 
it's a it's an elegant uh, approach. It, it, it's very inclusive in terms of you know, as you said, looking at these different parts of the the cancer hierarchy, the, the ecosystem that we now understand as you know, as you were saying at the beginning, is much more than just hey, this gene mutation or this specific protein, and, and, the, and the way you're going about it, I think, is again really elegant. Um, Contrasting that now to uh, a disease where we know, I guess, a lot less about, um, well, that, that we should in 2024, namely Alzheimer's disease, uh, would love to to hear a little bit about uh, your work in terms of uh, sort of categorizing the tau protein proteoforms. And, and you released this paper, I think this was December 2023, uh, journal uh, Alzheimer's Association, analysis of tau heterogeneity and proteome-wide changes Alzheimer's disease at a single molecule level. And here you do some really interesting work with induced pluripotent stem cells and sort of looking at um, sort of every change that happens along sort of this proteoform uh, chain of events. Uh, can you say a few words about that? Because clearly this is uh, uh, the major, I mean, not to, not to put one, into the, one of the major unmet medical needs of our time right now. So We'd love to yeah. hear what you're doing here. Absolutely. So when we think about the technologies that Nautilus is developing, it really has two different modes. One is the measure everything mode, where you want to measure all, all 20,000 proteins and you want to do it quickly, easily, uh, and across uh, as across time. Then the other mode is the, I want extreme detail. I want to study tau and understand it's, it, how its isoforms and its post-translational modifications the work together to drive behavior. And when we think about Alzheimer's disease, we know that tau is, is important. We understand that it has, it's forming these plaques at the early, how that happens, we don't really understand. We know that its post-translational modification state is informative of that. But that level of detail of saying, hey, in this set of neurons or secreted by these neurons or secreted by uh, associated glial cells, uh, what we see is we see, hey, this particular triply phosphorylated form and that particularly doubly phosphorylated form alongside this isoform, that combination is just a recipe for disaster. That's a recipe for an aggressive Alzheimer's disease uh, that we really need to to treat very, very, very quickly, we need to pay attention to. Or, hey, you know, this singly phosphorylated form over there, yeah, that's an indicator of, of an Alzheimer's disease that's going to progress on the decades time scale. And so, yes, we should be paying attention to it, but the, the pace and the speed and what we do about it might be very different, as well as the treatments that we use might be very different. So what we've been trying to do, what we're working on inside Nautilus has been developing this platform that is providing just extreme detail about tau. And by going down to the individual molecule level, going down to the intact protein level, we're able to say, hey, it is this combination of isoforms and post-translational modifications. This is how much is there. This is how that changes from system to system. So looking at model systems like, uh, like neural stem cells and organoids and mouse brains this is uh, how how do these things change when we uh, when we treat them with a different compound or over time as they age let's see how that landscape of this of tau this molecular heterogeneity changes and that level of detail really hasn't been done uh, the technologies in order to look at individual protein molecules at scale with this level of detail simply hasn't existed in the world. And it is just so beyond cool to have a new measurement in yeah. the world. Yeah. And every time we've introduced a new type of measurement, uh, it's it's changed our understanding of biology. And so I, I'm extremely excited about this ability to look at this kind of resolution and this kind of sensitivity at single molecule sensitivity uh, at at Alzheimer's disease and, and other tauopathies. It's uh, it's extremely exciting, and again, opens up a you know a whole new uh, you know dimension of this uh, this uh, domain. So now I'm I'm very excited about this. <laughs> um, you know, moving from uh, diagnostics to uh, drug discovery. Um, you know, a, a couple uh, 
weeks ago, I had on um, uh, Ron Potts from Amgen, and he was talking, you know, he leads their uh, sort of their induced proximity uh, research work there in terms of this, the the undruggable uh, part of our proteome. We have, again, this uh, amazing proteome, but unfortunately, we run into a lot of these weird shapes and, and components of proteins that uh, make them tougher to drug than the ones that are druggable. And I'm just interested in sort of this concept of uh, undruggability and sort of the weird aspects of proteins and how maybe some of what you're doing can help, at least in, you know, when we uh, have this amazing proteosphere out there to really go, hey, that uh, it looks kind of weird. Maybe that's not the best target uh, versus, uh, and, and, and let's talk a little bit more in general about how some of these tools can be leveraged to, to uh, expedite and enhance the drug discovery process. Absolutely. So I think if we go back again in, in history and we look at the evolution of tools that we had, chemical tools to actually target proteins, the, the easiest proteins to target historically were enzymes. And you could create a suicide substrate, a something that mimicked their natural substrate, but didn't behave in the same way and interfere with its ability to work. And that was that was from the first level. Then we had these antibody therapeutics, which really were just going after the protein itself yeah. and were preventing its ability to interact with its friends and neighbors. So coming back to what is protein function, is protein function just enzymatic function or Maybe we can just get in the way and say, you know, you want to go play with your friends and neighbors and we're putting this giant antibody on you so you can't go play with your friends and neighbors. So you can't execute your function. You might be enzymatically active, but you can't be in the right place at the right time. And so that was that next layer of, of types of therapeutics. And we also had antibody drug conjugates where you were just using the, the protein as a differentiator to say, oh, hey, this protein's here at this time and I'm going to put some other payload onto my antibody that just is a general cytotoxic. Uh, so when we talk about undruggable, the, you know, the antibody therapeutics are often able to target. They're not, they're not small molecule chemical therapeutics, but they are therapeutics. And so I think that even the nature of the word undruggable, uh, it depends on the type of drug you're talking about. So, uh, but I think what, what in general needs to be true is is that no protein operates in isolation and no protein only drives one thing so whatever protein it is it's it's somewhere in the middle of a cascade of of friends and neighbors that are working together to drive a behavior and so when maybe this particular protein here isn't very uh, uh isn't targetable by chemo chemical methods because it doesn't have an active site or it doesn't have a binding cleft or something. Uh, but maybe one hop down from it or one hop up from it. If you change the, the behavior of one of those proteins, that'll have the same consequence. So the methods for understanding those network interactions and how a change in one protein in the network has upstream and downstream and cyclic consequences. You know, uh, that ultimately will help us figure out where else can we poke in the network. And for maybe some of those proteins that were considered undruggable, that's fine. We don't have to go after them. We can go after one hop up or one hop down and understanding, or maybe we even go, you know, 12 hops down to the left because that's actually a more specific way to get at the phenotype we want. And the way that we can go about understanding that is by doing large scale screens where we, you know, overexpress, knock down, attenuate each individual protein or sets of proteins and see how that network responds, how the phenotype responds. And so uh, I, I think it, it comes down to being able to measure what is the system response to any particular perturbation. Uh, you know, you think about in 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 sports, for instance, you you know some different batter comes up to the plate and the infield shifts uh, to accommodate for that. Well, that happens in our cells all the time. Some protein goes up, the infield shifts, and half the other proteins change in response to that. Right now, we don't have a good understanding of the temporal dynamics of these shifts, and by making it easy for us to measure the proteome over and over and over again. So we can start observing the dynamics and the interactions and the dependencies. That's really what's going to allow us to 
go after the system behavior and not be so hung up on, I need to hit exactly this protein. Yeah. Particularly, uh, I was very intrigued by that because you have a whole section um, uh, in the Nautilus material and so the proteomics and toxicology. And I think, as you were mentioning at the beginning, you know, the, in terms of drug failure, uh, we, we just, you know, don't all we, we've really haven't spent a lot of time thinking about how when we shift those networks and, and hit node A, the, you know, yeah, we, we always think what's happening at node A. And, um, right. And, uh, we that's, can say. That, that's right. And I think that's that foundational understanding of just how humans work. Yeah. We actually have a, a ton of knowledge about disease, but for some reason, healthy humans don't like coming in to be studied and poked and prodded and understood. And so that question of, hey, we want to make sure that we're hitting something, but we're not hitting liver or kidney or heart or brain in some way we often don't have the foundational understanding of how these changes that we see in disease uh, or we see when we when we perturb with the therapeutic, what do they do to core systems in our body? And so that's all another piece of the puzzle that we really need to make sure that we're paying attention to is what's just what's normal human variation? what what is required for for just not having a tummy ache or not having kidney failure? You know, when we talk about the human proteome, um, it, well, there's a lot of other proteomes out there uh, on this planet, and, and many of them live within us and, and yes. on us in terms of the human microbiome. And, you know, I don't think a day goes by that we don't hear about some interesting connection of the human microbiome to health and wellness. Um, any interesting, you know, components of your research that you can talk about related to to this proteome because again you know we to have trillions of these organisms living amongst us uh that secrete and do all their interesting yeah. things just to symbiotically live with us any interesting applications of your tools in terms of sifting through and understanding those proteomes well i think i think understanding the the gut microbiome proteome the metaproteome is a particularly hard challenge for any any technology that wants a reference of reference database to work off of and so this is this is true for genomic technologies and others so i think the, the our particular technology at nautilus will be really well suited for understanding impacts of uh, and relationships not necessarily studying the metaproteum directly but for instance they do things like fecal transplants and or they'll have people eat uh, eat yogurt um, and, uh, you know, prebiotic, postbiotic, et cetera. And those things change our physiology in, in innumerable ways. We've seen uh, impacts with cancer therapeutic effectiveness. We've seen impacts on inflammation. So I think those kinds of studies of, of, of perturbation and response, I, th I think those are, those are really exciting for digging into the proteome, digging into the circulating proteome, uh, as, as well as organ systems. Studying the actual evolution of the gut metaproteome, for instance, is a very hard challenge. And I think we're not yet at a, at a place where it's it's straightforward to even know how to set up one of those, those studies because it's changing so quickly uh, and the composition is so so poorly understood. That's a just another another head area that's coming online, but you know clearly, um, you know, yeah, um, yeah. I'm 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 excited to learn more about it. It is it is I've I you know I'm on the scientific advisory board of a company that's looked looked deeply into into the microbiome, and it's it's a challenge. It's a really hard challenge. It's it's its own complex adaptive system within another complex adaptive system. Thinking of of, com of another area of complexity, um, and, I, and again, if, if 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 this is anything confidential, we don't have to talk about it. But um, I I was very intrigued, uh, and this was pre Nautilus days. But you had this really interesting um, paper on on ashwagandha uh, from back in the day. I think this was back in 2011 or so, where you were studying some <laughs> some some cancer uh, applications. Yeah. I love natural products and drug discovery, and I spent actually an early part of my career in that space. But it is one of those areas where. Um, 
Uh, I think most people would say that we have only sort of scratched the surface on understanding a lot of those metabolites out there. Obviously, a lot of them lead the, the groundwork for sort of the current pharmaceutical industry, but there's also a lot of things, again, in, in those proteomes, whether they're, you know, the, the small molecules they create or the proteins themselves. Any interesting applications that come to mind in terms of how we can, uh, I don't know if you want to call it bioprospecting or proteoprospecting per se, um, in sort of the natural products world, because it is an area that's kind of near oh, and dear is... to me. And it was just cool. When I saw your paper. <laughs> oh, it is so interesting. It is so interesting. And I mean, of course, the 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 poster child for natural products is Taxol, which of course came from the yew tree. And we we have no idea what biodiversity is being lost every day in terms of other potentially amazing natural products. And so I'm I'm very excited about about that area just as as a fertile source for for new or rediscovered treatments treatments that date back thousands of years and maybe you actually need combinations of multiple things together in order to have the benefit and the purified form actually disrupt some native interaction that's required. And so I, I think there are a couple really interesting, this is such a fun topic, uh, <laughs> fun, fun things to think about. One is from the natural products, you have the purified compounds, the taxols of the world. What is the, and some of those are proteins. Um, we know that there are also a number of toxins, venoms that are used for treatments in some way. What is the processing of those? How do they interact with each other to lead to a phenotype. So again, there's the natural product itself and then that we think is the active chemical, but it may have three or four other things that are in the leaf that it's really that combination that's required. So I think interrogating what is the cellular complexity of these things? What do the proteomes look like? What are pathways that are active that might give us a hint about what's, what's different? Uh, about that particular compound in that system than in other places. And then I think the other question is, again, we can do the studies and say, all right, well, let's take this extract and treat cell models, patients, people, et cetera, and observe what the consequences are. And in those consequences can be physiologic, things like inflammation, or they may be extremely specific in that they lead to a particular pathway being upregulated. So I'm really excited about that area. It's hard because you're you're dealing with so many different types of things all smushed together, often at low concentration. But what we're looking for, we're looking for things that have distinctive phenotypes. And so any place where we can get deep phenotyping information will help us. Just, you know, I'm personally excited about that, and, and the same reason as you are. And you know, I've been at FDA a couple of times with products like this. It was always, you know, if you took the ashwagandha, and it had, you know, twenty metabolites in it, and you know, it had these beneficial pharmacologic effects. But hey, wait a second, what's causing that biomarker over there to go up, and what causes that side effect? And and you get to this multi-dimensional aspect of it, and you know. I, I think, I mean, let's put it this way, I think your technology has a lot, <laughs> potentially a lot of uh, applications and sort of uh, uh, sort of a new generation of natural product discovery and development. And just, uh, I'll leave it at that, but it's pretty cool. And when I saw that paper, I was like, I got to bring this up because uh, yeah, Ashwagandha is pretty hot nowadays anyway. <laughs> it's, it's, well, it's, I, 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 I certainly, the, through that work, I, I learned a lot about the natural product side. And, uh, you know, my, my mom is trained as a pharmacist but she also believes a lot in Ayurvedic medicine. And yeah. so I think they're, they're very complementary. They're just often hard to study. And so it's, uh, it, that, that's the challenge is how do we develop systematic approaches to characterize these, these processes? Mm -hmm. Here comes Martha uh, C. Clark. Uh, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. You're doing some pretty cool, uh, uh, technology that uh, is doing some really interesting things, but I want to hear about actual magic and um, and what you're up to on that on that front because I know you do perform still and uh, to hear the background of when you get involved in magic and are you doing any shows and and what's hot on the magic scene? <laughs> uh, yeah, so I I've lived both lives concurrently for a long time as both a a professional scientist and a professional circus performer slash magician. And I, I love the, the, I, I feel like they really do complement each other in that they, 
the best scientists I know and the best uh, circus ma- performers slash magicians I know are all very curious and creative and have incredible attention to detail. And so I, I've actually found the two communities, even though they're often thought of as completely distinct from each other to actually have a lot in common. Um, of late, the probably one of the things that I've really enjoyed is trying to dig into what can scientists learn from magicians. And also, it, it seems like if it, in my research there, you go back in time a couple hundred years, the world's foremost magicians were also some of the world's foremost scientists. And the communities were incredibly close. You would see advances in electricity appearing for the first time on stage in a magic show. One of the first instances of what was you know, essentially a fluorescent light bulb showed up in a magic show. And, uh, you know, there, there was a, a gas filled crown that was placed above somebody's head and, and electricity at a distance activated the, the molecules in there, causing it to glow. And in the 1800s, this crown of fire was astonishing to people right. uh, and, and so there actually are, are tremendous overlaps historically between magicians as actual scientists and engineers, as well as magicians as purveyors and popularizers of science. And so uh, digging into that, I, I had a lecture just uh, about a month and a half ago at the Association, uh, American Society for Mass Spectrometry meeting. Um, very, very fun about 5,000 people in the audience. And uh, sh- we we chatted about the many relationships between science and magic and what we can learn, as well as things like perceptual blocks that we have. Magic takes advantage of perceptual gaps that we have, our brain fooling itself. And so by understanding those better, those potentially allow us to do better science because we're aware of those blocks that we have or those biases or um, and so that's that's definitely what I've been been enjoying is finding that intersection between the two. Outstanding. What's uh, what's coming up for you for Nautilus uh, as we get into the later part of 2024, uh, head towards 2025? Conferences, talks, uh, venues where we could run into you and meet you. Anything else on the calendar that is important that I missed and you want to mention, please? Absolutely. Well, the, the next best opportunity is at the Human Proteum Organization meeting uh, in in Dresden, Germany in October. That's the Human Proteum Organization meeting and the U.S. Human Proteum Organization meeting, which is typically in the spring, are our two biggest meetings. And so we really love to share the latest results. And and so we expect in in October to share some of this very exciting data on measuring tau in in extreme detail and what what one finds when one does that and just as well as how we do it so that'll be a really exciting we'll also be at uh the american society for human genetics meeting right around then as well and then in march of next year we'll uh february march of next year that the uh u.s human proteome organization meeting Again, sharing sharing a little bit more about our extremely detailed view of of proteins and diving into proteiforms, and, and but then also the broad scale side of the platform uh, even more, and uh, and showing the advances that we've made there. So those are, those are two great opportunities. But we also just love it when people reach out to us and and say hi and want to learn about learn about what we're up to. This is really cool stuff, and and I look forward to to getting to follow you, the company, and and everything that uh, continues to happen on all these fronts, whether it's diagnostics, drug discovery, interesting areas of uh, scientific exploration. So just really cool work. Um, again, for everybody that's going to be listening to uh, this particular episode of our show across the various podcast networks, or who will be watching on our YouTube channel, again, you've been spending time with Dr. Pragma. Malik, Associate Professor, Stanford University, co-founder, Nautilus Biotechnology, uh, doing really amazing things to to qualify, quantify and unlock this complexity of the human proteome for an entirely new area of scientific discovery. Uh, also, 
uh, you know, keep him in your calendar for potential performances uh, uh, as well in his uh, magic career. Um, uh, Park, I really, again, want to thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to, to talk to us for a little while about the range of things you're up to. Um, obviously, thank you for everything you do for science. And as we like to say on our show, uh, thanks for helping to create a better tomorrow uh, via the technologies that you're developing. Really an awesome story. Thank you so much. It's been so much fun chatting. I really appreciate the opportunity to sit down with you today. Great being on the show.